right, thanks everyone. Uh, it's a, a, an honor to be here. Um, and for the next 20 minutes, I want you to put aside what you know about stroke therapies, pre-hospital management and so forth. Create an open mind and I think when you leave, you'll be inspired, I hope, that uh, you know, you'll be able to create the level of collaboration that we've implemented in South Florida. So I have no disclosures, I wish I did. <laughs> um, so this is a talk focused on stroke, but let's start with something that you already know well, a STEMI patient. So this is a timeline of a patient that experiences chest pain at home, calls 911, goes to the hospital, and then a lot of downstream actions are triggered and eventually gets treated in the cath lab to get the coronary artery open. And if you look at it, the spectrum of care from pre-hospital to in-hospital to cath lab took about two hours and 45 minutes. If that is something that is shocking to you, it should absolutely be because today, STEMI, door to balloon times, as you may well know, are down median, you know, about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, okay, at most institutions, at most PCI centers. So let's look at the stroke workflow. So a patient arrives at the hospital, generally without an EMS pre-hospital alert. Then they go to the CT scanner, perhaps stopping by in their ER bay first, spending countless minutes there, then getting the clot-busting medication if they're eligible. And then eventually, the advanced modality imaging is done if the appropriate protocols within the hospital system are in place. And ultimately, the interventionalist is called and then they're taken to the cath lab, a very sequential workflow. So it perhaps is a surprise to most of you, but to me, this is shocking that, you know, today stroke treatment is managed this way. So if we're, you know, absolutely appalled the way STEMI care, you know, might be provided, you know, two hours and 45 minutes door to balloon time, and then you know, how can we accept a stroke workflow like this in modern day era with all the technologies that we have? So just like heart is muscle, in a stroke, time is brain, all right? So for every minute that elapses uh, in a patient that has a large vessel occlusion, meaning a large thrombus, you know, impeding flow to, you know, a big part of the brain, millions of neurons are at risk for reversible injury. And the more time that elapses because of avoidable pre-hospital and hospital delays, the worse the potential outcome for the patient. So we have to look no further than STEMI care over the last 20 years and the way it's evolved. So the pre-hospital phase especially with EMTs getting the EKG stat, faxing it over to the in-hospital team, activating the cath lab happens so quickly that everything runs in parallel. By the time the patient arrives, the cath lab team, regardless of the time of day, is already in the hospital at two in the morning versus 9 a.m., no matter what. And that patient is rushed to the lab and the artery hopefully opened up. This was an article in the New York Times last summer. There's been approximately 40% decrease in mortality rate, you know, largely due to optimizing emergency treatment protocols that includes EMS. Uh, most importantly. So this is a large vessel occlusion and a stroke. So these are the strokes that are most devastating. And for the last 20, 30 years, we've had no treatment for these types of devastating strokes. In the US, you have about 800,000 strokes per year, and approximately 250,000 or so are these large vessel occlusions. So in 1995, a clot-busting medication called IVTPA was approved by the FDA to treat strokes. The limitations were that it's a very narrow time window, just three hours. And moreover, the TPA was found to be very ineffective for treating large vessel occlusion strokes. So over time, primary stroke centers were established, you know, proficient in giving IV TPA, but if a patient presented with a large vessel occlusion stroke, the therapies were largely limited. You basically admitted that patient completely paralyzed to the ICU and then to a nursing home and left you know, permanently disabled. So over the last 15 years, we've had evolution of our stroke therapies beyond just medical treatment with IVTPA. What else can we provide? And 
We've had device after device come to the market starting in 2004. You may recall the Mercy corkscrew clot retrieval device, then a vacuum suction-like pump from Penumbra, and then ultimately third generation devices called Stentrievers. And when we studied these latest generation of devices, it was apparent, so that's the red bar there, that they're very effective at removing these clots and opening up the arteries in the brain compared to TPA alone, which is the blue bar. But as with everything, we wanted to prove it in a randomized control trial. So in 2013, the New England Journal of Medicine published three studies comparing best medical therapy at the time, which is IV TPA, compared to mechanical thrombectomy. And unfortunately, all three trials were negative. Why? Because the times to treatments were very long, the hospitals that were performing these studies were not well integrated with EMS, and therefore, the patients had bad outcomes, even though ultimately the same type of treatment was being provided. The other notable thing was, at that time, these latest generation of devices, the Stentrievers, had not been fully approved and on the market to be included in these trials. So now comes 2015. So this is you know, still a relatively new era in stroke, ushered in after these new randomized control trials were positive, again, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So within two years, we've had a paradigm shift in stroke care. First, we, you know, while I was still in training in 2013, at Mass General, I was so discouraged. I asked myself, why am I going into this field when you know, these therapies that we hope will save patients' lives keep coming out to be negative, at least in scientific research? So these trials, so the blue bars are the endovascular arms, and those were treated patients with stent trievers. And the main takeaway point here is that the time to treatment so from the time patient arrives to doing the CT scan, making sure there's no bleed, and then going to the cath lab, groin puncture, was less than an hour. Compared to all the other trials in 2013, where the median time to treatment was 124 minutes, okay? And the ad hoc analysis showed that in these trials, the key difference was a stroke system of care that included a, you know, a very concrete, well-aligned pre-hospital phase with EMS. So these are the stent trievers. It's ushered in a whole new era of stroke care. And so now we have a renewed focus on stroke systems of care around the country and around the world. What can we do to get patients the best outcomes possible now that we have these advanced technologies available? So we have better studies. We you know, obviously aim for better patient selection in the hospital with our imaging modalities, but it's fast times to treatment and that involves integrating EMS. Without EMS, we cannot do it. So need for speed and acute stroke right now is the hot button topic, it's paramount. And Hussein Bolt, obviously many of you know him, you know, he can run a 100 in less than nine seconds flat, but most of the hospitals in this country, unlike you know, these runners, they are way behind in their protocols for stroke care, okay? And so the ability to achieve rapid reperfusion in the cath lab is very critical right now, but we have to step back and back to the basics of you know, what's important in the pre-hospital care first. So these are all the different steps I've outlined in terms of you know, what we did in South Florida to get patients from the field, from their home via EMS to the lab as quickly as possible. And if you look at all these steps, Look at the ones that involve EMS, okay? So revising the triage protocols, you know, implementing a large vessel occlusion stroke scale, uh, new technologies that I'll mention, and ultimately optimizing the workflow in the hospital. So the first is stroke education. So recognizing the signs and symptoms of a stroke in the community, that work for educating the community falls on the hospitals in the region as well as EMS. And so the FAST campaign came out several years ago to educate potential stroke patients, you know, that, look, if you have facial droop, arm weakness, speech, then immediately call 911. Because the data showed that 60% of stroke victims wait more than an hour before they call 911 to get to the hospital. And by that time, when the TPA time window is so narrow, you may be well out of the time window for any acute intervention. And so 
The next thing we did is deploy the EMS large vessel occlusion stroke scales. This is the workshop we held yesterday with Dr. Peter Antavi and Mark Ellis. It was very well received. We reviewed all the large vessel occlusion stroke scales and the feedback was amazing. These are scales that just went you know, live over the past year or so, published in the literature, validated, and we implemented this in South Florida. This is a scale that not only includes the face weakness, the arm weakness, and speech deficits, but moreover, what we call cortical signs. So cortical signs are those where blood flow in the brain is so compromised that it's likely due to a large vessel occlusion, that the patient's having complete hemineglect, hemiplegia, and global aphasia, meaning they can't talk, they can't follow any commands. And obviously, the most important one that confers a LVO is gaze preference, deviation of the eyes to one side or the other. If any of those signs or symptoms are present, we instructed our medics immediately just call a stroke alert to the hospital, and then we'll alert the cath lab downstream. So by the time EMS arrives, this basically has become our EKG. Okay, so that cath lab is activated in parallel and can achieve rapid reperfusion and hopefully save lives. So the next step was, okay, we have great stroke scales. How do we use those to impact triage criteria? So in this country, we have stroke capable hospitals that may be able to provide IVTPA, but such a narrow time window. Then there's thousands of primary stroke centers that are JCO certified, but only a handful of comprehensive stroke centers. So for that reason, we had to instruct them that look, based on the scale, triage either to a PSC or a CSC, and to avoid interfacility transfer delays, if you are you know, uh, suspecting a potential LVO based on the scale, just go immediately to the CSC. And that saves countless minutes and millions of neurons in return. So, the next step was, you know, look, we can be a guide to EMS because all of this is so new, hot off the press, that let's assist you in getting these patients to the appropriate treatment facilities. So as soon as I joined Memorial Healthcare System in 2014, I gave every EMS agency in our region my cell phone number. In fact, I made this wallpaper that they could install on the home screens of their smartphones so that if they had a stroke patient, immediately they knew who to call. And we would fire up FaceTime, something so simple. These apps are available on our phone for daily use for socializing. Why not use it to save lives? And the next step was the power of activating a stroke alert just you know, with your fingertips, right? So innovative apps such as Pulsera, where you enter in just a few fields and immediately all the downstream stroke team members in the hospital get alerted including the ER physician, the nurses, the CT techs, the cath lab techs, whoever you want in this pathway based on the process at a given hospital can be part of this uh, system. And we have utilized it for the past year and I think it holds a lot of promise in streamlining workflow, improving communication, and ultimately uh, the outcomes uh, for stroke patients. So there are apps like Tuiage that allow for EMS tracking if we can order a cab using our smartphones, a black car via Uber, and see exactly this location up to the point that it reaches you, why can we not do that with EMS agencies and the ambulances? The technology is there. It's all about implementation and a way that the user interface makes sense to the person in charge. So mobile stroke units, I saw there was a ambulance here parked uh, you know, for the demo. I think this is, uh, such new technology, great concepts on the horizon. In my opinion, excellent for rural communities where perhaps the nearest primary stroke center may be miles away and you are able to obtain a stat CT scan while en route in the ambulance and send that via televideo, telemedicine to the receiving hospital and they can, you know, real time interpret the scan, feed back to EMS and deliver a clot busting medication within the golden hour for IVTPA. So I think technologies like this are excellent and you know, are being actively studied in areas such as Cleveland and Houston. Within the hospital, imaging is paramount. All of our decisions are made based on what does the scan show? What does the CT show? What does the CT angiogram show? In order to quickly decide, 
I should not have to be at my desktop, you know, in the middle of the night or whether I'm out with my kids and, you know, be limited to access to imaging. So if we are, again, able to order a Starbucks coffee from the palms of our, you know, uh, at our fingertips, why not put imaging in the same frame, right? Because ultimately, the quicker I can access such tools, the faster I can make that decision and be in-house and ready to treat the patient. This is the pathway we've implemented. This was published uh, in Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. And it's basically, you know, the first 15 minutes, you know, once you receive the EMS pre-hospital alert, get that patient straight to CT, bypass the ER bay, make that decision for IVTPA within the first 30 minutes, and then go straight to the cath lab. In today's process of, you know, stroke systems, this type of parallel workflow is almost unheard of. Yes, there are pockets of areas throughout the country that are practicing this way, but ideally what we would all love to see is with EMS integration that every system in the country, every comprehensive stroke center is performing at the highest level possible so that no matter where you triage your patients, ultimately they receive the best care. So what have we achieved as a result of EMS integration? Data is king, right? So let the numbers do the talking. So the farthest left bar is if in the hospital, you know, patient arrived and there was no EMS alert and found to have a large vessel occlusion, the time to get that patient to the lab and groin puncture was 71 minutes. Now, if you look at the far right, if you have EMS alert and with the LVO scales that I have a high pretest probability, I activate the lab and the time is more than half, okay? So you can see that the numbers are drastically reduced just simply by pre-hospital alerts. And data shows that for every 30 minute delay in time to reperfusion, the likelihood of a good outcome for patients is reduced by around 20%. So you can imagine older patients, their stroke is evolving quickly, especially our elderly population in South Florida, these minutes matter. And the more we integrate and align ourselves with EMS, the better the outcomes. So here's a prime example, a 74 year old that arrived completely paralyzed on one side, CT scan was done immediately on arrival because we had the EMS alert, and you can see the clocks at the top, they do the talking, right? So to cath lab in less than 30 minutes, to groin puncture in less than 45 minutes, and the artery opened within an hour. We're achieving the same workflow that STEMI patients receive. So there should not be any difference, no variability between a heart attack victim and a stroke victim in terms of timely care in the new era of mechanical thrombectomy. Here's another patient. This individual was out golfing. You know, he's a snowbird visiting from New York and completely just went limp on one side. Call 911 and guess what? His wife was a former dispatcher for EMS. She immediately recognized the signs and symptoms got the patient to the hospital while in parallel doing a pre-hospital stroke alert, and we had that patient in the lab within less than 30 minutes, and the artery opened up. And his whole carotid artery was blocked all the way to the terminus, so stented it, took out the clot with one of these stent trievers, and the patient was back golfing two weeks later. These types of outcomes were unheard of, you know, just even five years ago, okay? So, it takes a team, all right? We cannot do this in silos just at our hospitals. Integration with EMS is paramount. And so I hope that this talk has inspired you to go to your regions, to your hospitals, and ask them what are our protocols, what is the process, because now it's a whole new era in stroke care. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. And as somebody who has come up through the EMS system and, and been a part of this community for a very long time, it's nice to be home. It's nice to be with all of you talking about uh, a story of something that happened to me that I think personalizes why it's so important for us to have a first responder network that can provide prioritized communications for public safety. And so I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. I want to take you uh, to an event that happened to me about 18 months ago. Uh, I was going through the, the death of my father-in-law, and he had had cancer and spent about a year in cancer treatment. And my wife and I were in Illinois, and he was in hospice care, and we knew that he was likely to pass away over the Christmas holidays. 
And as we work through that, um, you know, the tough times, those last days, all of you have seen it, all of you have held the hand of someone as they go through this. And most importantly, you've seen their, their very last moments. Uh, he was able to die with dignity. He was able to uh, get through that event, and it's always hard. And this happened on January 2nd of 2015. My wife and I, after that long week, uh, returned back to the Washington, D.C. area uh, where I work now, and we were exhausted. It was the weekend. I uh, barely had time to recover before the, the, the work week was going to start again, and I had been out of the office for a little bit of time to, to work through this. And I had to go to the Consumer Electronics Show, somewhere where technology uh, certainly is being uh, talked about. And for the last couple of years, I've gone there to talk about public safety technology, the internet of life-saving things, and those kinds of things that can really change the way we perform public safety services. But I have to admit, I was pretty exhausted. It's, it's a tough time. We've all gone through that with parents and other things that are going on. And I got on my flight in Washington, D.C. at Dulles for a direct flight to Las Vegas. And Unlike almost every other flight I've ever gone on, I didn't do work. I didn't jump on the internet. I didn't uh, use Wi-Fi and get caught up on email. Instead, I got on that plane and I just went to sleep. It was actually uh, somewhat of a relief. Uh, I spent a couple hours uh, not thinking about a whole lot and just getting ready for the busy week ahead uh, and the busy year ahead that we were going to have at, at FirstNet. Um, when I landed, I, I turned on my, my two phones. As many of you, uh, I have more than one smart device in my pocket. Uh, when I turned on those devices, I had that terrible sinking feeling. And what happened was I, I, I just started having messages pop up, text messages, voice messages, and it was not normal. Anybody who has been through this, when you turn back on your device and something bad has happened, you know something bad has happened. And I had that sinking feeling. And the sinking feeling was obviously that something had gone wrong. So I look at the names of the people who had called, and it was my sister. And I love my sister to death, but it's not somebody I talk to every single day. And the fact that I had four messages in rapid fire from my sister, I knew something was wrong. I then had a message from my wife. I had a message from my chief counsel. I knew something terrible had happened. But then you have to check that message. So I listened to the messages from my sister, knowing that obviously something had happened to my family. And the first message said, something's wrong with dad. Call me. That's it. Hung up. A few minutes later, I'm driving to dad's house, but the ambulance hasn't passed me yet. This is not a good sign. Call. Where are you? Next thing, I've arrived at our, at our father's home, and, and you've got to call me. Quickly, call. And then just a very negative message of call when you have a minute. And I knew something obviously had happened to my father. Without even listening to the message from my wife, I just picked up the phone and called her. She's been my best friend for well over 20 years. Uh, over 22 years ago, we got married. She was a flight nurse at Life Flight, where I was a flight paramedic. We're one of those EMS relationships that I guess occur over the years. And I knew she would give it to me straight. We have a very uh, great relationship and friendship. And I called her, and she just said, your dad just died. My dad was much younger than her father. Uh, I had talked to him on this day earlier in the day, and he was perfectly fine. My dad... Um, I never, ever expected this to happen quite that way. Very young, way too young to have this happen. Uh, just an amazing experience to go through being on the other end of being part of that family, dealing with the, the, the net results of what we all know each and every day. So I, I called my sister, I called my mother after that. I'm sitting on a plane on the tarmac in Las Vegas, not exactly the, the best place to have this kind of a conversation. You've all been there. Uh, I asked my sister what happened. That's what we always want to know, what happened? And she said, you know, your father, he ran on the treadmill every night for 45 minutes, and he went down at 6 o'clock and ran on the treadmill like he always did, but 45 minutes later, he didn't come back up. And so my mother went down to check on him, thinking that was odd, and she went down there, and he was on the floor in cardiac arrest. Um, she did what we would want anybody to do in that situation, and she dialed 911. Um, for somebody of her age, actually, it was good that she dialed 911, because probably the last six medical emergencies she's seen, she did not dial 911. So she had figured out that's a good thing to do in this case, which is a big step forward for my mother. I'm proud of her that she actually called 911. Um, and, and we live in a, or my family lived in a very rural area of Pennsylvania, the Poconos, uh, a volunteer EMS service, uh, terrific county paramedics that now respond. Back in the day when I was a volunteer, we didn't have uh, the, the extended ALS services that they now have. 
and uh, the local fire department was barely a mile away. Um, they responded, he had obviously been down for too long already, and they couldn't resuscitate him. Nothing more they could do, nothing more the system could do in that situation. The sad part for me, though, is I know as EMTs and as paramedics and as the EMS service that we all are a part of, that we can do more, that the technology that exists today, the things that exist today that can make this outcome differently. And so I ask myself, what if? What if things were different? What if technology was used in a different way? You know, what if my father that day was wearing a smartwatch? What if that smartwatch could detect some other kind of rhythm or something that was going wrong and be able to let him know that? And what if in that situation, things happened differently? And so I kind of want to walk through a story that is the what if story. What if something different were to happen? What if that watch that happened to be on his hand when he was on the treadmill that day let him know that he was having the abnormal arrhythmia? What if he was able to tap on his smartphone to notify a number of different people that something was going wrong? What if it automatically called my sister? What if it automatically told my mother, his wife, that he was having an abnormal heart rhythm while it was occurring before it killed him? This is something that that technology exists today. We're not necessarily using it in that way, but it's there. What if that also allowed him with one button to notify 911 and they were notified 20 minutes sooner than they actually were? What if that changed that continuity of care of what could have occurred that day? What if when somebody called for 911, even during that situation, but the difference was that dispatcher was able to get two-way video? You just heard Dr. Meadow talk about you know, having two-way video for the ability to be able to, to, to see a stroke patient and see the difference in that. But what about two-way video for what's happening at a scene? What about situational awareness for those EMS responders that are coming? What if in a location where it takes a long time to get an AED to a scene or to get a defibrillator in advanced care to a scene, we have AEDs that can be delivered by a drone, by an unmanned aerial system? What if we have the ability to get AEDs somewhere in one minute because they're going by air and they're not dealing with the traffic, they're not dealing with the roads, they're not dealing with the snowy weather, whatever that may happen to be? What could that do to change that actual outcome? What could it do to change the speed of care that if a bystander was able to actually do something with that and change the outcome in that first 10 minutes after that cardiac event? What if you had two-way video and voice with the dispatcher so that they could actually see what's going on and relay that to the incoming EMTs and paramedics and what's going on in that scene? What if those changes actually occurred and had a different outcome at the end of the day because when EMTs and paramedics arrive, those shocks that have already occurred, they're able to do the advanced care that needs to happen, they're able to do the 12 lead EKG, they're able to alert the STEMI team so that when that person gets to the hospital, everybody's ready to do what they can do to have that definitive intervention that will change a life. And what happens when that patient gets to the emergency room and goes straight to the cath lab and that patient has a dramatically different outcome? To me, this is the world that we live in today. We've changed cardiac care dramatically. We haven't necessarily changed it quite as much in rural America, but there's no reason why we can't, especially with technology today. At the same point, we in public safety have not really always taken advantage of technology quite at the same rate as many others in the community because we haven't had a dedicated network. We haven't had priority, we haven't had preemption. Well, I have to admit the main reason why I came back to public service was to make sure that we have a network that is going to be able to provide the kinds of public safety applications, the kinds of life-saving applications that can make a difference. You heard about just a few earlier today, but I believe that the people in this room, I believe that each and every one of you are going to be part of that innovation that changes the way that we provide emergency medical care in the field, not just in the United States, but around the world. I believe we can be the innovators that actually drive the way that we share information and get it in the hands of those that need it most. And that's the people in the field. That's all of you who are out taking care of patients each and every day, who are part of really innovating in what needs to happen, and also making sure that technology is not a burden. Technology should make your life easier as an EMT or a paramedic. It should make the job of taking care of patients faster and more efficient. And it should allow you to free up your hands. It should allow you not to hold the cell phone in your hands and give a report to an emergency room. We're in 2016. Why don't you have microphones and capabilities that are built in and have ability for all of your monitoring equipment to send data when and how you want with voice commands so that you're not spending your time with your hands on a phone when they can be on a patient? These are the kinds of things that I think will really change and revolutionize the way that all of you provide 
emergency medical services across this country. I'm really excited to see this ongoing innovation and what happens with different guides. You saw some good examples today from Dr. Mehta on what can happen when folks at the hospital really know what's coming in, that they have the data quick and early, and most importantly, when we recognize some of the critical care patients that we come across. There are many things today that exist in the hospital community and that exist in the pre-hospital community, but are not necessarily connected to the way that we do our business. We're not getting the economies of scale from big cities being able to be shared with small communities when it comes to technology. One of the things we need to do is have a default open way to communicate and to share technology across the United States, and for that matter, across the world. We need to have the ability to take technologies that can work in a hospital setting and make sure that they're shared with folks in the pre-hospital community and are made inexpensive and cost-effective and allow us to really make that change. And to me, that's where that internet of life-saving things really comes in. If here in New Orleans, where you have been absolute leaders in the pre-hospital community, you come up with amazing ideas for an application, a way that the EMS community could share information with police officers, firefighters, emergency rooms, ways that better life-saving care can be delivered. If you can share that with the other 60,000 public safety agencies just in the United States, think of the difference that we can make when we're creating that application, we're, we're taking that life-saving advance, and we're sharing it on a network that will allow many others to benefit from that same capability. Doesn't matter how small your agency is, doesn't matter you know, how much money you invest in technology, if you have access to that same kind of innovative software, that same kind of innovation that's going to occur, I really believe that we can change the world of EMS care in the United States, and we can do it now. I think as we provide a network, as we provide the ability to have priority, preemption, encryption, great security on that network, and have the ability to send a large amount of information having the ability to send video, HD video, having the ability to send data back and forth between dispatch centers and public safety in the field, and most importantly, between public safety and other first responders in the field, we're gonna change the way that we do our roles for the better. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is the innovation is gonna come from each and every one of you. I wanna do a little survey here in the room. How many of you today have a smartphone on you, in your pocket, in your hand, you're texting at this exact moment, majority of you. How many of you have at least two smart devices on you right now? Smart watches, smart phones, more than half the room seems to be raising their hand. How many of you would be interested if we could come forward as a first responder network and provide you a smartphone, a, a dongle, a wireless card for your computer that would allow you to have the ability to have priority and preemption on a network with a public safety applications ecosystem at the same price or better than what you pay for service today. How many of you would want that in this room? All right, I think that uh, it shows that there is a need, it shows that there is a demand, it shows that we need to make this happen. And I think what's important about that is let's talk about priority and preemption. I think one of the reasons why we haven't fully leveraged technology is that when networks get congested and big events happen, sometimes you can't get through. Sometimes the quality of that call is not good enough or you get dropped. Sometimes you are not able to send that video that you want to send or those pictures that you want to send from the scene to where it needs to go. So one of the important things for the first responder network, FirstNet, that we plan to do is we have, we'll have priority and preemption on this network across the country. We will allow access to every single police, fire, and EMS agency in the country. It's the same spectrum. It's the same network. It'll have the same priority and preemption capabilities for all of you. And so you're not fighting and competing with commercial traffic to be able to get a signal. You're not fighting to be able to have that signal go through at the speeds that you need it to go through. And that you'll be able to leverage the same kinds of technology and the same kinds of technology that are on their smartphone that every 16-year-old child uses today, but in a way that will save lives. And I think having that ability to save lives with technology and not just use technology to improve what we do 10% better, but to use technology to improve what we do 10 times better. And I think we need to challenge ourselves to think a bit more outside the box. I think that all of you here in this room know more about what would make your life easier or better as a paramedic, as an EMT, as an EMT intermediate, and what you do to be able to change the lives of the people in your community, to be able to change the way that you all work together and share information. My default, I've worked on, on public safety for a number of big events, a number of Olympic games from a public safety perspective, 
And the one thing that always seems to work is when we share. When we share information, when we train together, when we work together, it doesn't matter if it's 10 agencies, 20 agencies, 100 agencies. I've seen it happen in the US and I've seen it happen abroad. We work best as public safety when we have a default that is open, when we have the default that we share information with each other so that we all have the information we need. There will be great opportunities to crunch that data and make it useful and to be able to share that with each other, but I guarantee you our technology community will do that with us. I guarantee you the technology community will embrace emergency medical services, not just because it's a market, but because the mission matters. If you think about it, I've gone out to talk to developers. If they have the difference between creating the next video game or creating the next application, because paramedics and EMTs in this country are demanding it because it will save lives, they're going to choose to save lives. They're going to choose to make that difference in their community and in this country. But that's only going to come from each and every one of you. Over the next year, we're gonna be bringing plans to all the 50 states across this country, the five territories and the District of Columbia for a state plan for the FirstNet network in that state. Get involved, learn more about it, learn what it can do for you. Learn what pulling together this Internet of Things can do for you so that we can move from the era of 30, 40 years ago when we thought we were sending information from the field to hospitals, but what we really can do today. And we know that we've come a long way since emergency. We know that the technology that exists today can be really game-changing for the future, but I think it's up to each and every one of us. Let's find ways to change and leverage the technology we have to be more effective at saving lives, to be more efficient in the use of our resources, but most importantly, to do it in a way that will make a difference in our communities at home and will make a difference for each and every one of our agencies. So it's personal to me. I hope it's personal to each and every one of you. We have the power in our pocket to really innovate and change the world of emergency medical services, not in the next 10 years, in the next year or two. We have the world that we can leverage in what's going on today across the, the entire world when it comes to emergency medical care and to be able to really change what can be done in the field, which will change what can be done in the hospital, which will change the outcomes for patients that we see each and every day. So let's work together to do that. Let's make a difference and let's leverage technology as part of that. Thank you. Hey, hey what? Whew. Boy, I was a lot younger in that picture there. So good morning. I have the privilege of uh, being able to spend a little bit of time with you this morning and um, talk about um, who we are and what EMS is. And it struck me that one of the interesting things, by the way, greetings from Texas, uh, just a little uh, something we're doing over there. It strikes me, it strikes me that I, you know, it actually just struck me that that slide came after the worm slide. That was not intentional. I don't have, I just realized that little misstep. But I have a problem, and I'll tell you what my problem is. I love EMS. I don't just like it, I love it. I love the smells, I love the sirens, I love the screams, I love the guts, I love going into people's world and making it better. I love going into private places that no one else can go. I love going places with law enforcement, our colleagues, I like seeing shit that's going all over the place, right? And helping to make it better. I love that. That's sick. I love that. But if there's any solace in that, the solace is this. You love it just as much as I do. We have a problem. We love that, am I right? We love it. We love being in other people's problems. We love bringing order to chaos. We can do it better than anyone else, and we'll tell you that, and we'll show you that. And the worse it is, the more we enjoy solving the problem, right? Your choice. Multi-vehicle car crash on the interstate, abdominal pain. Your choice, right? <laughs> so we have a problem. And I'm gonna argue this morning I'm going to argue that where EMS has come from, and don't you think for a minute there, by the way, that Bill Cosby said, oh, God, I forgot about that one. It's like, <laughs> oh, no. So 
where we've come from, from moving the sick and injured from point A to point B, being transported to being a practice of medicine, being a part of a system, as TJ just described, being a system that takes care of patients outside of the hospital, a system that you dial three little numbers and we'll come solve your problem, whatever your problem is. We'll come solve your problem because our problem is we love solving your problems. We want to see the gross stuff. We want to come in and fix your world. We want to fix the public's world. So all of my career, people have asked this, what are you? Are you public safety? Are you public health? Are you emergency medicine? Are you critical care, primary care, mobile health care? Are you the safety net? We talk about that all the time. Here, let's answer it once and for all. Yes. Yes. I don't want to argue about public safety or public health. We are all of that. We'll solve your problem and we'll do it in the rain. We'll do it in the snow. We'll do it in the mud. We'll go into a hole and do it. We'll go into bad smells. We'll solve your problem. Wall Street Journal, two weeks ago, had this in the paper that said, hey, guess what? There's a revolution in EMS care. It's us. We're the problem solvers. And the Wall Street Journal said, look what they can do now. Look what's going on. Look at the technology. Look at the mission. It's so totally different. We have a problem. We love this stuff. We love fixing other people's problems. So just like hold my beer, watch this, <laughs> right? Hold our stethoscope, watch this. Because EMS, the profession of EMS, our mission, our culture, what we love has changed dramatically. And let's walk through that change. But I'm gonna argue this, our problem, our problem has become the solution. When something goes south, you can count on EMS to step up and say, you know what? I want to bring order to your chaos. I want to do it better than anyone else. And I want you to make it as hard as it can be because I'm going to come in there, I'm going to fix it. So what does that mean? It means stuff like this. It means the largest public health crisis right now is the opiate epidemic, right? So in many of your states, I can go to Walgreens, I can pick up a little Narcan for the party over the weekend, make sure that whoever I'm taking to the party got a little Narcan just in case it gets really good, I'll wake them up, everything will be fine. They'll say, look, I've just fallen asleep, I had two beers. You can fight with them now, we don't have to fight with them anymore, right? So all of a sudden, we become a public health entity to say, if there's publicly accessible Narcan, we have a whole new patient population. And that's the patient that's been reversed that we now have to go manage. But you know what? We'll solve your problem. We'll do it better than anyone else and give it to us as hard as it can be because in essence, we're gonna be able to help solve the cultural change in narcotic, uh, opiate uh, overdose and Narcan administration in our streets. Like this, we can go into a community and we can say, here, law enforcement, here, public, here's a hot spot. Here's the heat map of where our narcotic overdoses are in this particular community. And by the way, don't go down to the Sam's Club right there where the big red spot is, <laughs> unless you want to buy something, right? So we can help solve the problem. Mariana Brady da Costa, you know who she is? You know who this guy is? Muppets? How about Superman? How about Patty Duke? What do all these people have in common? They have a problem that we can help solve, just like he had a problem that we could help solve. What's the problem? They all died of sepsis. They all died of a time-dependent illness that we can make an impact in. Because now the public is starting to look, saying, hey, look, this isn't something that we need to respond to on a calendar. This is a second hand, a minute hand. This is a time dependent problem. So we can get in there in something that has a higher mortality than STEMI stroke or trauma. We can get in there and start to change morbidity and mortality from sepsis. And the data tells us that we can make a difference in that, that we can help with initiation of fluids, with activation of the hospital in that patient population. And this little problem, it's here to stay. I wish it weren't, but it's here to stay. I had a discussion with two nurses in the airport um, in New Orleans yesterday, and we were talking about, they're from Seattle, and we had the discussion that said, you know, how odd is this? Almost everybody in the airport probably knows how to do compressions. A big chunk of them know how to use a defibrillator. 
maybe 10% would know how to use a tourniquet. But this stuff's on the news all the time. So we have a problem, and we're going to solve it better than anybody else, and we're going to do it when it gets toughest. So we're going to learn from all of these things. We're going to learn from the Colorado Springs um, shooting in Planned Parenthood. We're going to learn from San Bernardino. We're going to learn from all that, and we're going to be better. And we're going to do things as all this evolves. We're going to do things like help the public understand there are very simple solutions, very simple solutions to what they perceive as a complex problem. And we'll tell them it's not. This is what you need to learn. This is how you learn it. This is a difference you can make. And hey, by the way, stop the bleed. And it's pretty simple to stop the bleed. And hey, by the way, we're going to help solve this problem because we're going to help put wound control kits. We're going to put hemorrhage control kits, public access tourniquets, public access hemorrhage control out into the public. Anybody from Charlotte, North Carolina? Charlotte, North Carolina, this is your airport. I saw this and it's like, woohoo! Solve your problem. Because in that airport, not only do they have a defibrillator, but right below it, they said, you know what? If we got a nut job in the airport, which by the way, there are plenty of nut jobs in airports. If we got a nut job, I mean, Scott travels a lot. So if we've got a nut job in an airport and there's a problem, public, we're gonna teach you how to manage that. We're gonna teach you how to save lives and we're gonna make it available to you. We're gonna learn from our colleagues in the military. We're gonna take the principles of the battlefield and we're gonna apply them in a civilian setting. And we're gonna do it in a way, because remember, we wanna bring order to chaos. We wanna do it better than anyone else and we want to do it when it's the toughest. So we're going to be able to translate that to our communities so our communities feel better and feel safer. We're going to learn from them that maybe a freeze-dried lyophilized plasma could sit on a shelf in an ambulance and be available and be reconstituted to help expand volume in rural areas or in long-distance transports. You heard a lot uh, this morning about the changes in technology. I haven't talked to my children, my kids, they're teenagers, I haven't talked to them for two and a half years. They'll only text me. Not gonna talk to you, Dad, I'll send you a nice text at Christmas. Okay, fine, love you too, smiley face. So text 911. <laughs> My kids wouldn't know how to call 911. How the hell do you do that? I don't know, text them. So the technology that allows us to do things different, the idea that hospitals want their patients, oh my word, to be treated at home. Could you have surgery and go home from the hospital and the operating room and go home and be recovered there? And teletechnology essentially transmits your vitals, all the information, so that a different level of care provider, hey, by the way, maybe that's us, goes into that home and takes care of a patient recovering from surgery in concert with the hospital. Look at the hospital at home initiative. Look at the, the ability to telecommunicate with physicians, clinicians, PAs, all over the place. I mean, Dr. Maida was kind enough to give everyone in the world his cell phone number. Thank you for that, by the way. Big hand for, you know, any problem at all. <laughs> so we can communicate better, as you heard in the previous discussion. There's gross stuff that we can catch. It's like, are you kidding me? How do you spell Ebola? What was that? When that came out, it's like, go to the main medical reference, Google, and figure out what Ebola was. That's what I had to do. There are other diseases coming. Four days ago, I don't know if you, you've been following the evolving news on Zika. So the microcephaly in pregnant patients who are infected with the Zika, vi Zika virus is devastating. So now there's an indication that it's not just microcephaly. It's not the deformity. It's not that particular structural defect. It may be seizure disorders, visual disturbances, learning disorders. So all of a sudden, all these mosquito-based illnesses become very, very tough to sort through. And could you imagine EMS being in the public health mode and helping to spread the information about, come on, use of mosquito repellent? You bet we could. We can solve problems. We can take care of the highly infectious even when we don't understand it, and we love doing it. Like my colleague that transported that patient, and a year later, he shows me his tattoo. We love getting into other people's problems. We love solving them, and we like doing them in a way that no one else can. By the way, I asked him, I said, you single or married? He said, single. I said, listen, if you're handing someone a glass of wine, you might want to use your other hand. You know, it's like, hi, I'm having a nice night. Whoa, got to go. Whoa, out of here. So you heard about CT ambulances. 
So could it be that this technology, or as it evolves, as we've talked about, maybe that becomes a rural assessment? You know what, maybe, just maybe, if we want to solve folks' problems, could you imagine the same kind of technology in a remote area that looks at traumatic brain injury or head trauma and helps us decide where that patient population goes? Looking at things like EMS hospice, could you imagine responding 911 so a patient wasn't going to be resuscitated? Because patients wish they, they've planned everything out, and we would go to say, we're going to be there so resuscitation doesn't occur, and your wishes will be honored that you can die comfortably. Could you imagine that? Exactly right. EMS at the healthcare table. You know what? Five years, four years ago, we started talking about this mobile integrated healthcare thing. What the heck is that? So last week, an article gets published that says, hey, guess what? A large population of patients that's being managed in a combined ma uh, manner with physicians, nurses, paramedics, in a mobile integrated health environment, guess what? It actually does financially and clinically make a difference. We love solving people's problems. We love doing it when it's hard, and we can do it better than anyone else. Like concussion. So I'm watching the uh, UT game the other day. It was a bad game, by the way. Watching the UT game, and I hear in the back the announcer saying, looks like they're undergoing the concussion protocol. You know, it's like warms my heart. Not that someone got a concussion, but the fact that there's an organized approach to looking at something that we've really underestimated. The fact that, you know what, there are going to be little LEDs that are going to be on the back of helmets. I don't know if anyone's seen any of this technology yet. There'll be a time that we're going to be called. In many of your communities, you may get called to say, hey, listen, uh, Bob Johnson, he's a high school football player, his, his uh, LED's red. Oh, good for him. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> so impact on the helmet that says, if I've got a green light and I'm playing lacrosse or I'm playing football or I'm doing it, I'm green light, I'm good to go. But if a parent looks at my kid and says, hey, Harrison's got a red light. Out he comes into the concussion protocol. Why? Because we can take care of those patients better and faster. The idea that a helmet will know how hard a patient's hit, so we'll know how great the potential is that that patient has a concussion. The idea that a mouthpiece, and by the way, these are all in existence today, the idea that a mouthpiece could give us data on movement of the head, movement of the neck in space. Do you like how I did that, by the way? Movement of the head. I'm feeling sick. I think I might be throwing up here. So the idea that a mouthpiece could give us data, instead of saying, well, did anybody see him get hit? Hang on. Let me interrogate the mouthpiece. Let's look at the data. Oh, hang on. You know what? It needs to be transported and evaluated. The idea that we could respond to a motorcycle crash and the frickin' helmet is the airbag, right? So if you're like me, I'd respond to that and go, oh, this is bad, right? <laughs> oh, that's bad, what is that? <laughs> the idea that our patients, and by the way, these are real, that our patients are being protected in a different way. The idea that the suits that they wear become the airbags on the motorcycle or on the bicycle. So that if I have a nasty event, essentially it deploys. Because if you're like me, we're going to this saying, look, this guy's got the worst sub-Q emphysema I've ever seen. This guy, <laughs> regardless, he's not gonna have a spinal injury, but he's gonna have two needles in his chest. <laughs> so we got some work to do, right, as we move forward. But we love to solve problems. And we love to work with our colleagues in industry to say, if we're doing this, we've got to be prepared. We've got to work together, as was brought up, to figure out what the new world looks like. This is some of the data that you can get out of helmets, some of the data you can get out of mouthpieces, some of the data, as was talked about earlier, the data you can get out of OnStar with a car crash, the data. We have data that's available to us all over the place. The idea that that data would be able to say, high likelihood this patient's going to the OR, launch an aircraft. Does that sound odd? Not at all. It's our new world. It's how things are evolving. So we do have a drone. We have a drone. This drone delivers drugs. It has a defibrillator on board. Um, it has the ability to deliver TXA. It's got two-way video communications. 
actually I made that up. I just wanted to put it in there because it sounded kind of cool, but you know what? I agree. Drones are a future for emergency medical services. They're already being used in law enforcement. They're being used in fire suppression. They're great surveillance tools. There's already a whole approach to e-commerce, or sorry, to aerocommerce, to being able to deliver Amazon. Why couldn't it deliver drugs? Why couldn't this get to a patient in the middle of the Boston Marathon? Or why couldn't it get to a hiker? Why couldn't it get out to the ski resort faster and be the first first responder that walks through what that patient needs and what that patient requires for his or her morbidity or mortality. So this was three hours ago this morning when I woke up. When this happens, and it's ironic that we're sitting here in New Orleans, I remember that day distinctly here. And many of you are in this room and you remember that. And you remember as things were kind of gearing up. And here's our dirty little secret. Here's your problem. Here's my problem. As gross and as hard as all that stuff is, all that stuff was, as gross as Matthew hopefully won't, but may become, and by the way, I don't know if you saw, but it took a little turn this morning, which is good. Um, as bad as this, this could potentially be, every single one of us sitting in this room has a little spot in our brain that says, but that would be cool to respond to that. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Absolutely right. So our problem, our problem, we don't ever wish those disasters on anyone. We don't ever wish catastrophic events. We don't ever wish bad stuff. We don't wish amputations, car crashes, but we do have this wish. If it's going to happen, let me be there. <laughs> let me be a part of helping to fix that problem. That's our problem that's become the solution for the rest of the world. We love it. We cherish being able to work in that environment. We want to make chaos better. We can do it better than anyone else can. And the harder it is, the better it is for us. So we have a problem. And our problem has become the solution for all the other stuff that's evolving out there. So with that, hold my stethoscope. Hold my stethoscope and watch this. Hold your stethoscope. Watch this. It is a fabulous time to be in emergency medical services. It is a wonderful time to be a part of a conference like this, to learn about what's going on, to stock up on tools and stories and all the spirits downtown. And thanks for what you do and how you do it. And thanks for the privilege of talking to you this morning very much.